Yeah, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge that uh, we're meeting here in Mackay today on Yui land, uh, the, the home country of the Yui borough. And we'd like to acknowledge that they have never ceded sovereignty and pay respect to their elders from time immemorial until the present and ongoing into the future. I'd also like to acknowledge that everyone else who's in this meeting is also joining us from uh, Indigenous country somewhere in Australia. And also would like to pay special respect to the, uh, the Witty and Vera people who are leading a campaign to protect Urana Creek, which is one of the places that will be uh, spoken about tonight in this presentation about the gastric brooding frogs. Um, the gastric brooding frogs are very interesting species for a number of reasons, and our presenters will talk more about that. Uh, but basically, you know, they're given that name because they, uh, they, they lay their eggs, they're fertilised and then they gobble them up and they brood or, you know, allow the, the young to grow inside their stomach and then they were expelled, uh, you know, sort of a projectile vomit um, into the environment as fully formed frogs. Very unusual and, you know, has a lot of um, uh, interesting things about that that could be a benefit to human beings but unfortunately they are now both listed as extinct. And what we're doing tonight is trying to find out how can both of those species or one of them come back from extinction. Um, the, um, uh, the two speakers we have, are Dr. Conrad Hoskin uh, from the uh, James Cook University in Townsville in North Queensland. Uh, he's a specialist uh, in, in well, a naturalist um, and I'm sure he'll tell you more about his specialty, um, but he's uh, leading a, a, an expedition that may uncover uh, gastric brooding frogs in the Yungla range in places that people haven't looked before. And our other presenter is Mike, uh, doc, uh, Professor um, um, Michael Mahoney, who is the person who discovered the northern gastric brooding frog back in 1984. Uh, and he's also been working with a team of scientists to extract DNA from uh, dead southern gastric brooding frogs, put them in uh, new in, in living frogs um, cells, and watch them uh, and hope to replicate them and get a new southern gastric brooding frog bred from uh, from a dead specimen. So that's uh, that present presentation will come after Conrad's one. So I'll just um, hand over to Conrad and uh he can he can take it from there we'll just hold off on any questions until the end but if you'd like to put any questions into the chat if you're online or if you're in the room here just hold your questions until the end and we'll probably have five minutes um for conrad and then we'll move on to michael and you can ask questions of michael after that okay thank you thanks peter i'll um just uh share my screen up there <coughs> Can you see that? Yes, no problem at all. Okay. I'm gonna leave it off full screen mode just because I lose control of my mouse then and I wanna use it through the talk. Um, hopefully that's all right for everyone, the view you have. Um, so I forgot to put a slide up about myself, but people may be interested. I'll just tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, it's always good to know who's um, presenting to you. So I am Dr. Conrad Hoskin. I'm a lecturer up at James Cook University. So I'm sitting in my office here in Townsville giving you this talk. And uh, I always describe my research as everything to do with biodiversity. So I'm interested in uh, what's out there. So that's part of my research involves species discovery. So I go to remote places on Cape York and other places and sometimes find new species. Um, I also do some phylogenetic work, some genetic stuff. I'm interested in how uh, biodiversity forms and can adapt to future uh, change like climate change. So I do various experimental and evolutionary style projects on that. And more and more my research has shifted over the years towards conservation projects. So um, like some of the stuff I'll tell you about today. And also I do work with spotted tail quolls and uh, various other rare frogs and geckos and all sorts of things. So. I sort of like, I'm interested in all of biodiversity. And over the years, a lot of my research has involved frogs and reptiles. And in uh, particular relevance to our today's talk, I've worked a lot on um, frogs in North Queensland, up in the area we call the wet tropics region here between Townsville, Cairns and Cooktown. 
and I've also worked a fair bit on the frogs at Yungala, uh, surveying for the for populations of the endemics and, and other things like that. Okay, so today's talk, I'll talk about um, the basic structure will be, I'll tell you about the problem with uh, chytrid fungus and why it's causing frog declines. Uh, I'll then, then zoom in on Australia and talk about uh, the wet tropics initially. And I'll talk about the wet tropics because that sets up for why, we why I'm gonna survey in particular areas at Yangala. And uh, then the last part of the talk, I'll talk about Yangala, the special frogs, and um, uh, what the planned surveys are. I won't dig in too much to the gastric breeding frog detail because I think Michael will cover that more, um, you know, the interesting breeding biology and stuff like that in his talk. Okay, so I, I think most people are aware that frogs uh, over recent decades have undergone some significant declines. But it doesn't apply to all frogs. Things like green tree frogs are doing just fine. Uh, cane toads are doing just fine. But there are some frogs in some parts of the world uh, that have declined quite significantly, including in rainforest in Australia. And there's all sorts of impacts on frogs, uh, just like there are on all other animal groups. So clearing, uh, impacts on waterways, there's, there's a whole myriad of things. But one particular problem has emerged for frogs in recent decades, and that's a fungal disease uh, that in this talk I'll shorten to chytrid. And chytrid has been uh, now, the declines and extensions of many species have now been attributed to chytrid. And um, I'll tell you a bit about that through this talk. Okay, so on the IUCN list, you'll now see, you know, literally hundreds of species listed as critically endangered. And if you clicked on any of those species, you'll see that the primary threat for many, many of those species is uh, this fungal disease. Uh, some species that we, that are kind of high profile on this front with the golden toad in Costa Rica, that's that image down the bottom right there. Uh, that species went extinct, uh, largely due to chytrid it seems, and the corroboree frog, our famous yellow and uh, black frog in the Alps down south that's um, suffered very badly from chytrid and is kind of like not in such a good way at the moment. One of the interesting things with um, chytrid is that the, de the declines kind of took people by surprise because they occurred in many remote rainforest uh, areas where these areas are often very well protected otherwise. So they're inside a national park, places like the uplands of Yangala or the mountaintops of the wet tropics. It's just not the sort of place within a well-protected national park that you'd expect to see declines. And the same thing happened overseas in places like uh, Costa Rica and other parts of the world where you just suddenly have these frog declines in areas that's, where the habitat still looks pretty good. And after a while, people got onto the fact it was a disease. Uh, that disease was then identified as a, as a fungus. And um, that fungus is, there's the species name of the fungus. It's a, it's a type of chytrid fungus that feeds on uh, like keratin in frogs. And here I'll just refer to it as chytrid fungus. It's a waterborne fungus. It uh, infects the keratin on frog skin and uh, under the right conditions, particularly cooler conditions, it can uh, over, basically overrun the frog and it, the frog ultimately dies of a cardiac arrest. If this happens through much of the population, you can get population crashes, and if, in, if my, all or most of the populations are in uh, these areas that where the, where the individuals are quite prone to this fungal disease, you can have really severe impacts on the frogs, even extinctions, as we've seen. So it, it, it's in water. The transmission is primarily through water. There's uh, also transmission through frog to frog contact. One of the great unknowns was and still remains to some degree, how it so thoroughly gets across all these waterways um, given the next slide will tell you that it's a novel disease. I should, probably should have had that one first in Australia. Somehow it gets across all these waterways uh, and infects the frogs. And um, there's any number of ways from natural ways through to people moving stuff that's wet between catchments. Basically, uh, chytrid needs to be thoroughly dried out or cooked under extreme heat um, to, to basically kill it. For a lot of our gear, we subject it to bleach to sterilise it between sites. It's a um, remarkably... Um, uh, good thing at getting between cat, uh, streams. So there's still a bit of a date, debate as to where chytrid um, fungus, the, the chytrid fungus that infects frogs uh, and originally came from. There's been debate over whether it's Asia or Africa, but in places like Australia, there's strong support that it's a novel disease. So you can see across the world, a pattern of spread over decades. And then within regions like Australia, you can see a pattern of spread, for example, from Southeast Queensland through the 80s up into the wet tropics around the 90s. Uh, 
Some other work I've been doing has been to uh, map the northern limit of Kittred. And at the moment in the north of, of Queensland, the northern limit of Kittred sits at the end of the wet tropics up around Cooktown, around that Starkey area. And then there's a quite a hot, dry gap um, that Kittred has not yet got across into, where, into areas that are potentially modelled as suitable. So places like the uplands of Cape Melville and some other mountain ranges on Cape York. Kittred isn't there yet, so the, the northern limit of Kittred in Australia is up around Cooktown. Uh, it just seems to have reached a pretty a bit of a limit there against that hot, dry stuff. Okay, so there's various reasons to believe Kittred's a novel disease in Australia. And it's hit Australian frogs pretty hard. So the obvious uh, most severe impact of Kittred is uh, if all populations disappear and the frog goes extinct. That's what's happened, it seems, to the two gastric breeding frogs. Uh, also, other frogs like uh, two of the Tordactylus, uh, one on the right there is Tordactylus acutirostris. Uh, another one in the wet tropics is another Tordactylus. So the six frog extinctions have been in Queensland. They were two in southeast Queensland, one at Yangala, which is uh, Rivatrachus spitalinus, which will become a topic of this talk. And then uh, three in the wet tropics, two Tordactylus and one tree frog, Latoria niacinensis. So they're the really obvious hard hit ones. Also, a lot of other species have been hard hit by chytrid but aren't extinct, and there's still remnant populations. So famous examples are the gastri um, sorry, the corroboree frogs down south, the two of them. Other ones are some of our wet tropic species that have just hung on. Uh, there's a famous, uh, you know, a well-studied example now in central Queensland at Crimbit Tops. Trilactylus pleone is down to um, a small number of individuals uh, as you know, the fight goes on to save that species from extinction. So you get these, in some environments, persistent populations. Uh, a pattern in the wet tropics where some species lost their upland populations, but not their lowland populations. So it's been a whole myriad of effects uh, across different habitats and across frogs of different ecologies. I wasn't studying frogs quite when, uh, as early as when Kittred first hit the wet tropics in the uh, late 80s and early 90s. But I did, when I first started studying uh, frogs in the wet tropics rainforest in the mid 90s, I was still in the northern wet tropics, particularly, we were still seeing the effect of uh, those first, that first big wave of chytrid. So on some streams, I remember when I was first up there, you'd actually go along and find uh, quite a few dead and dying frogs that, you know, had poor writing response. And some of the classic signs of chytrid fungal disease, which is uh, quite a vascularized ventral surface sometimes, they often look quite puffy um, and they just appear very sickly. You can test for chytrid in a couple of ways. One is to do uh, look at skin under the microscope, and the, but the more commonly used technique these days, the one that we use is uh, PCR techniques where we do a, a genetic detection of chytrid on individuals. So you can swab frogs and then you run it on a, uh, in a particular type of PCR that actually gives you an estimate of not just the presence of chytrid, but also the disease load. Okay, so one of the really interesting things with the effect of chytrid in Australia is that, as I said before, there's been some interesting patterns of uh, impact. So some species uh, went extinct, other frogs, uh, they lost their um, upland populations, but not their lowland populations. But then interestingly, some co-occurring frogs didn't seem to be particularly impacted by chytrid. And a couple of the very broad summaries you can make from this is that population, uh, chytrid does, has the most impact in cool upland areas. So chytrid fungal disease has an optim, optimum temperature uh, for reproduction around 18 or sort of to 20 degrees. So upland areas spend so much, you know, a frog sitting in an upland environment like this mountaintop stream here in that picture on the right, spends so much, I mean, being an ectotherm, it's spending, it's the, basically the temperature of its environment, spending so much time with the cool body temperature, chytrid's on it, the chytrid disease really hits the frog hard. In some areas in the lowlands, the temperatures, are, the frog's average body temperature is a lot higher, chytrid has a lesser impact. It uh, appears to matter how much time you spend in contact with the water, which makes sense because chytrid is a waterborne fungus. So up here in the wet tropics, even up on the mountain tops, the terrestrial breeding microhylid frogs, which have basically nothing to do with the streams, didn't seem to suffer any chytrid impacts. Whereas right next to them down on the stream, the stream breeding frogs suffered severe impacts. Okay, so if you look at a place like um, uh, Yangla where you are or Townsville here, there'll be There'll be chytrid in the lowlands, but you don't particularly see uh, frogs impacted by it. Whereas uh, if you go up into the highlands of Yangala or for me up into the highlands of Paluma behind here, that's where the chytrid impacts uh, were and continued to be. Because chytrid remains in the environment, it's all over the place. 
Okay, so uh, there has been some good news stories amongst all the doom and gloom of lost species. And one of those was the armored mist frog, Littoria lorica. So when I was first doing research in the wet tropics, I'd look through the guide books and I'd see this species, Littoria lorica. It didn't even have a, a photo that was definitely of the species. Most books used an illustration because a couple of the photos that did exist for lorica were deemed dubious. Um, and I'd look at it and think, man, it's such a shame we lost that frog. I, I, it was actually one I never thought I would see. I was amongst, uh, just like other people, I was really determined or, you know, sure it was extinct. It was known from the uplands of Thornton Peak. And um, it's, we, many of us had been to the historic sites, which looked much like this, streams up in the cool rainforest. Uh, the species only lives on waterfalls and cascades and it breeds, sticks its eggs to flowing water, like it'll put its eggs in amongst here in the fast flowing water. They're stuck to the rock as a jelly clump. And then the tadpoles have a massive suctori suctorial disc and they hang around actually in the flowing water, just sort of like vacuuming along the surface. And the frogs themselves basically never leave the splash zone and spend much of their time in the water. Classic candidate for chytrid impacts in that all the sites were known from the tops of mountains, wet areas, in streams, everything was like, you know, bang on for chytrid impacts. And the frog was nowhere to be seen at its historic sites. It's still never been seen anywhere near its historic sites. Then uh, in about 2010, a colleague of mine was working on waterfall frogs, which are the, the bigger ones here, Latoria nanotis. There's a Latoria lorica there. And he phoned me up and said, uh, last night when I was up, uh, we went down to another site way out in the dry forest. And there was all these nanotis, but there's these other little ones. They look a bit like a juvenile nanotis. Maybe they could be lorica. Um, can you have a look? I was living in Canberra at the time, but I happened to be at Cape Tribulation for my sister's weddings. But so I, hopped in the car, went up and met him the next night and we went out to the site and sure enough, there was a, a population of Latoria lorica that had survived the declines. So that's 20 years after the decline. So nearly 20 years after was the rediscovery of this species. The, the last sighting uh, was 1990 and then the, that's when Kittred came through the Northern wet tropics where the species is. And then it was about a 20 year gap before Rob rediscovered them up at, um, on the back of Carbine Tableland. So, we straight away got very interested in how on earth this population had survived in the rainforest. And it actually wasn't surprising that we'd all miss that population because it wasn't in, in anything that would be considered typical of Latoria lorica habitat. It wasn't in rainforest. It wasn't in these little cute upland streams. It was in a much bigger stream out in the open forest, like around it was eucalyptus and grassland and stuff like that. The one thing that of course was there was the water with the stream and that that's sourced by those rainforest mountains above so it's a permanent stream which the frogs need but it doesn't have rainforest around it and we we, we got very interested in that we got a government grant then to go and survey all sorts so our, our hunch at that point was that the open canopy and the westerly aspect of this site made it a much warmer environment which um, consequently made frog body temperature on average warmer which consequently kept a lid on chytrid disease so based on that, we went around, uh, we got a grant and we surveyed all the other sites around the Northern Wet Tropics where we could see streams coming out of the rainforest mountains, going out into open canopy habitat and being particularly with westerly aspect and having this kind of hotter environment that the frogs might live in. It was fun work. We hit most of these via helicopter and it, would in, it was pretty full on work. So we'd, we'd be dropped off by a helicopter on top of a waterfall like this. We'd spend a couple of nights surveying we try to do a kilometer down to the you know as far down as we could and as far as, up as we could to the rainforest um, and then we go on to a next site what we found we didn't find any more populations of the armored mist frog Latoria lorica despite going to sites that looked seemingly ideal like other open uh, canopy hot sites but what we did find was that Predictably, at all of these sites, we could rock up and find populations of the waterfall frog, Latoria nanotis, which at that time was listed as endangered, and other endangered frogs like Latoria riacola at these uh, sites. And that, that was quite significant because for Latoria nanotis, you take, for example, Windsor Tableland, that uh, Latoria nanotis was believed to have gone extinct from Windsor, Windsor Tableland during the decline. So there were no records uh, at Windsor after the declines, yet we did. Uh, four streams around Windsor Tableland out in the open canopy forest and we got the notice on all four streams. So it became a really consistent pattern that we could quite predictably go to uh, one of these sites so we could pick off Google Earth and find populations 
of these frogs, even though we couldn't find them upstream in the rainforest at those historic sites. Even better was that we were finding these frogs like Latorina notice at really high sites too. So back up at, at sites like 1,900 uh, or 1,000 meters elevation if it was an open canopy site. So this environmental effect uh, really does seem to be, hold, uh, be, be a strong effect um, and populations of some of these frogs can persist with chytrid in these environments if it's warm enough. And they don't just persist, they, they're actually hyperabundant at some of these sites. So the abundances we have for some of these species like Nenotus and Lorica are considerably higher at some of these sites than they, uh, they were at those historic rainforest sites. So these sites are actually uh, sure a, a really good habitat for these frogs. Anyway. Moving on. <laughs> and it was quite spectacular, the sort of sites we could get rainforest frogs at. So this site here is off the western, it's Piccaninny Creek off the west side of Windsor Tableland. Uh, it's up north of Mount Carbine. If for anyone that's sort of driven up uh, onto the Cape, you, you'll know that sort of area. And that is open forest with spin effects all over those hills. And yet there's these things we call rainforest frogs there. They are still nonetheless restricted to these mountains that are sourced out of rainforest streams. It's just that in these environments, the frogs are essentially aquatic, they're getting all the invertebrate prey they need around the uh, streams. These streams are permanent, they're adequate for breeding and all those sort of things. Um, more, than, more than adequate looking at the density, they're actually prime habitat. So this was all very exciting. We swabbed frogs everywhere we went, which was many, many sites. We found that chytrid was basically everywhere. So you grab a frog, this, you have a set routine of X number of swabs on the belly, hands, back, etc. That swab, it's, you can see the swab, it's a bit like the sort of thing that might get shoved up your nose nowadays for a COVID test. That tip then gets cut off and put in a preservative. Then we run the qPCR to work out presence, absence of chytrid and estimate uh, infection load. So we basically, if I were to summarize those results, chytrid is everywhere. It doesn't matter if it's a rainforest site, an open forest site, it's just everywhere on the frogs and the tadpoles. We have some of the highest prevalences of chytrid recorded at these sites. And yet, these frogs survive very well at these sites, um, and they uh, we we only ever really get deaths of frogs at these sites during abnormally cold, quite long stretches of cold conditions in winter. And we did a bunch of thermal stuff as well, and what we found was that indeed frogs at these sites do spend a lot of time at uh, quite elevated body temperatures. So, what this photo up the top left shows is a, a thermal image. And that rock is quite warm. It's up around, you know, 23, 24, 25 degrees. That frog has just emerged in the evening from very cold stream water. It's a, it's a very cold frog. The stream water is cold. But it then spends hours sitting on those rocks because they often move just out of the splash zone and sit around like these guys are. That rock, especially with the westerly aspect and no canopy cover, has absolutely been baking in the sun. So, and in, I'm sure most of you know the thermal inertia of rock is, is quite spectacular. So we could sit at 9 or 10 p.m. on these rocks and they would actually feel warm to the touch. So for a frog sitting on those rocks, it's elevating their body temperature really nicely. It's probably, it's basically uh, putting a lid on chytrid in, uh, infection every night that they're doing that. So as I say, the frogs persist well and the only time we really see uh, chytrid impacts are in unusually cold snaps, it's particularly extended cold snaps in winter, which are not very common up here. So we're quite convinced that uh, this whole temperature thing, uh, reducing the chytrid impacts is a, is a solid um, hypothesis and it's what we're, I'm working on now as I look towards, uh, you know, more targeted surveys at Yangala. So, Yangala has three endemic frogs. It has a whole bunch of other interesting frogs, but the three endemics to Yangala are the Yangala tinker frog, Tordactylus liamai. It's a, a lovely little frog with a high pitched call that sounds a bit like metal tapping on metal, like a tink, 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 tink. And that frog likes the seepage areas in the headwaters of streams. Uh, you know, if you drive out of Yangala Township towards the start of Dalrymple Road, some of those little gullies you cross there with uh, rocks and palms and not much water in them. They're, they're great for this, this species. That frog appears to have taken a decline during the chytrid impacts at Yangala in the 80s, uh, but it's, it was never really quantified well that decline. And that species, it, it appears to have had a steady recovery um, because we can find it at lots of sites at Yangala now, but we're not really sure just how badly it declined and then recovered. Either way, it's, that frog's actually doing okay. It was, it was listed as near threatened for some time, I think, um, but we've actually got it at at most of its historic sites. And more actually, we find a lot more sites for that frog. The Yangala day frog, Tordactylus yangalensis, that, that was hit hard by chytrid. 
And I can't remember the period, but it was, you know, deemed missing for quite some time, maybe a decade. It was thought to be extinct. And then it was rediscovered at Finch Hatton Gorge. As I'll show you in a minute, we've got a whole bunch more sites for that. It's a species that's uh, it's listed as endangered, but it's, um, it's living with chytrid in many places around Yungala. And uh, it's in places it's doing pretty well, including up at, still up at um, Finch Hatton Gorge there. The final one is the particularly famous frog for young adults, the northern gastric breeding frog, Rheobotrichus uh, vitellinus, which uh, Michael will tell you a lot more about that. He's had, a, I mean, I never saw this frog in life. Michael not only saw it in life, he discovered it. So Rheobotrichus vitellinus is one of the two gastric breeding frogs in Australia. The other one was Rheobotrichus silus, which was down in the, the Black Orland Conondale Ranges in their, their Sunshine Coast hinterland. The Vitellinus, I think the, uh, it was described in 84, the last sighting was something like a year later. It really was, it appears to have been hit pretty hard by chytrid, just like Silas down to the south. Neither species has been seen in, uh, you know, for decades now. They're both deemed to be extinct. And uh, the truth is they, they, they probably are both extinct, including Vitellinus. I'm going to now bang on about how I think I'm going to rediscover it, but the, you've got to put that in, the, in perspective of, um, uh, it's more that I hope I really, I'll rediscover it. You've got to put that in perspective, the fact that it probably is extinct. I'll explain why I still have some hope though. So this is the, a couple of images from a paper we put out, uh, we had out recently, which kind of like is a, a summary of current frog knowledge for Yangla, uh, including for these sort of high profile endemic species. What these you know, uh, symbols show on this map are survey sites, all these um, dots, either open or closed in this, these figures are survey sites for uh, pre-decline for on the left Rheobotrichus vitellinus, the gastric breeding frog, and on the right Tordactylus yungalensis, pretty much all by Keith MacDonald. So what this shows is that the black, this field circles, the black ones are the presence records. So that's where Keith got, uh, and I'm sure Michael and others got um, Rheobotrichus back then. And you can see it's very much concentrated on that so Yungala Township's down here. So you've come up from Mackay. There's the turn off to Finch Hatton. There's Finch Hatton Gorge up to Yungala Township. Then you get out on Dalrymple Road up to that high country at the end where the road finishes. So this is that high country up the end there, the highest peaks at Yungala. And this, these are the, the creeks and slopes below down to near Finch Hatton Gorge or, or into Finch Hatton Gorge. This was the known distribution. There's also a record. Um, I can't remember it's this one. Michael could probably correct me, but there's a record at Owen Creek, which is out a bit to the east. So uh, very focused in that area. That was the pre-decline records. And here are the a similar situation for young lenses. Young lenses, Tordactylus young lenses, the day frog was more widespread and still is. So records out along Dalrymple Road, Finch Hatton Gorge, and also close to Yungala Township and to the south there on those, uh, in those other creeks that you can access on those roads. So here's, uh, I don't have a map here for uh, Rheobotrichus vitellinus because, the, okay, firstly, I'll explain what all these dots are. These are all the dots, survey sites by myself, Harry Hines, um, John Clark and Ed Mayer in the last 20 or so years. So we've been hitting a lot of these sites pretty hard, uh, trying to find populations of two other populations of Tordactylus, trying to assess how well they persisted or didn't persist in certain areas and also trying to rediscover or uh, find Rheobotrichus, the gastric breeding frog. So once again, all the sites where we didn't record a particular target species, like on panel A here, which is Tordactylus yungalensis, are clear, and the sites where we did detect that species are in black. If I put up the uh, gastric breeding frog map, it would just be a whole lot of uh, open circles because we've never found the gastric breeding frog. If we look at Tordactylus yungalensis, we've uh, it's persisted pretty well. Like it, it, there appears to have been a very clear initial decline, but then um, it's probably been a pretty decent recovery. So out on the Eastern Escarpment here, lots of young Galenses sites down around Finch Hatton Gorge, lots of positive sites that they're, they're persisting well down there. But a dropout in the Southern areas here, we've never managed to detect. I'll just flick back to the other map. There were a bunch of sites down here, which they see the Southern part of Yangala, they seem to have been genuinely lost from. A positive though, is that I've gradually become more and more interested in this whole region, this great big western flowing uh, region of Pla Creek, Massey Creek, Urana Creek, all through here. So most of these sites out through here are, are my sites. And uh, I got a population of young lenses out here, which was exciting because it probably suggests 
with fairly little survey efforts to detect them there. There's probably quite uh, extensive populations through these creeks, and I'll be following up on that. So young lenses is still uh, doing okay. Um, and then, sorry, that should say uh, Toractylus liam. I don't know why I wrote uh, day eye, it's the tinker frog. The tinker frog, uh, we've got lots of sites for that. We're, as I said before, we're never really sure how much that, that did decline, but the Tordac that Tordactylus is of great interest because the closest relatives are Tordactylus in Southeast Queensland and the, sorry, the Krimbert tops one and the wet tropics one have declined severely due to Kytrid. Uh, the wet tropics closely related species went extinct. The Krimbert one is on the, kind of on its last legs in the wild at the moment. But hopefully it will still recover. Uh, Liamai, lots of sites, uh, it's doing pretty well. Okay, so the one, th one thing you can notice with these maps though, is both from the pre-decline pre and the post-decline, great big sur um, surveying gap through here. So that's all the, the headwaters of these western flowing streams. You can see the pre-decline, pre we had no data for those areas. Post-decline, we're just starting to add a few sites. So the areas that I'm particularly interested in fall within this uh, rectangle on this map. And, they're the headwaters, particularly of Urana Creek, um, not just the headwaters, but down into some of that quite open country and also uh, parts of Pla and, you know, the headwaters of all the associated creeks that flow into Massey Creek as well. These areas, uh, the reason I am so interested in those is everything I just said about the wet tropics uh, frogs, where even in areas where we cannot find these species up in the, wet, in the historic sites in the rainforest, um, we can find them quite predictably downstream where it's a hotter environment. Uh, the gastric breeding frog was only known from rainforest streams, and that would be a, a, someone could criticise my ambitions to survey these areas by saying, you know, they're not rainforest, they're not suitable habitat, but we would have said the same for Latoria lorica, the armoured mist frog. We would never have looked in those big open um, forest streams down there. So, yes, that might be true that we can't find gastric breeding frogs here for that reason, but we don't actually know that because there was a lack of uh, survey effort when the species was around before. So the hope is that out in one of these, somewhere in these westerly flowing streams on a relatively warm westerly aspect stream, uh, maybe even a side stream coming into, the, into that mainstream of Urana or something like that, we'll find a population of, or multiple populations of gastric breeding frogs that have persisted with chytrid in a hotter environment. Regardless of whether we find gastric breeding frogs or not, I'm sure we'll find a lot more populations of Tronactylus youngalensis, an endangered species, and who knows what else we'll find of interest through there just because these areas are so poorly surveyed. Um, it's quite remarkable how little survey effort there's been through there. So, so that's the plans, the ambitions, um, and yeah, so any, any questions, I'll be keen to take them. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Conrad. Uh, yeah, so if anyone uh, in the room here has a question, um, then we can ask it and I can put you on uh, video. Or oh, I've got one. Um, I, are you using, uh, we, we talked about the Irwin's turtle with uh, Cecilia Villacorta Raff and uh, with um, uh, J Jason Schaeffer from Schaeffer from um, JCU a, few, a month or two ago. Um, are you, is that one of the techniques you are using to determine uh, whether the gastric green frog may be in those streams? And how would you get the DNA from it? Is, are there still um, uh, specimens around? Yeah, so um, I, these surveys will be mostly traditional surveys. So that's going in, we'll, it will be helicoptered in, we'll have a bunch of teams and we'll break up and we'll go up different streams. And that's the, that's the way we want to do this mostly. However, at all sites, I'll be collecting water samples as well. So uh, actually Cecilia and I have a paper in, in press at the moment or in final stages of revision that'll come out soon with molecular ecology where we tested Latoria, that Latoria lorica, the armored mist frog population. We tested how far downstream we could detect it with uh, eDNA techniques, and we could detect it up to 20 kilometers downstream, which was a very positive and exciting result. So what on these surveys that I'll do around um, next year on the western side of Yangala, I'll be going in, spending nights and nights doing traditional surveys, going up there, spotlighting with a low powered torch to try to get eye shine, hear calls, that sort of thing. And then as we leave every site, or actually when we first arrive at every site, we'll be taking um, one litre bottles of water and then subsequently we, uh, we directly precipitate that water for the DNA and then we, uh, we go from there. 
in regards to your question of what kind of um, material uh, sequences we have to compare that to, yes, we do have uh, genetic sequences for vitellinus for the um, ones that we'll compare to. So basically, we'll just have we've got a barcoding strip of that, and then we'll just compare to that, like we've done for Lorica. So I, I hope we find them through, through traditional techniques, but you know, it'd be just as fantastic if we detected them through uh, eDNA. The, well, the obvious advantage with eDNA is that you can sample downstream and catch all these streams that if it's a needle in a haystack situation, it'll help you detect what's upstream of you. You just have to then go through a process of uh, trying to find where in that upstream catchment that um, DNA came from. Well, uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks so much for that, uh, Conrad. Um, just ask you to take your um, uh, screen share off now, if you could. Uh, and it's amazing, you know, like the amount of work that's being done in science and, how, you know, how dependent we are on this basic research. We don't know where it will lead, but it has, uh, you know, led to other people understanding a whole lot of microbiology that is, you know, probably going to protect us from things like COVID in the future. So it's, uh, it's really important work to be doing. Um, I'll just say thanks again, uh, Conrad, and we'll probably move on now to uh, Michael's presentation. So uh, Professor Michael Mahoney is from University of Newcastle in New South Wales. He is the person who discovered the northern gastric brooding frog, but he's also been working with a team on, uh, I think it's been named Project Lazarus, uh, with the aim of resurrecting the southern gastric brooding frog. So I'll just sort of hand over to you, Michael, if you'd like to share your screen, if you've got some slides to do. <laughs> Are you on mute, Michael? I don't. There you go. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, thank you very much for the very fine invitation. Um, I would like to say hello to some very special long term friends who live um, in the Mackay area. Jan Graham sitting there. G'day, guys. Um, if it wasn't for COVID, we'd be saying hello a little bit sooner. And for Deborah Pergolotti, who is also online, who I've known for a long time, um, dealing with the frog. So uh, if there are some other names I've missed there, I can't see anybody's name. G'day. Um, so the gastric brooding frog, I'll just take you through a little bit of a different um, sort of um, science to that of Conrad. Um, uh, the reason for having a drawing of them is because there are so very few photographs of Rheobatricus vitellinus. Um, I was very fortunate to have an artist friend, um, Betty Thorne, draw that for me. Um, that's the one good photograph I have of the first specimen that was collected um, in 1984. It was actually on um, Christmas Eve. Um, so that's what frog biologists do. It was a good party. Um, so I want to take you through some different sort of approaches to dealing with extinction. And it's a general approach that could be applied to all animals. And um, in fact, it's already well and truly applied to plants. So um, our experiment um, goes a little bit like this. We have a male frog who we can obviously collect sperm from. And we have a female frog up here that we can induce to release eggs. And then what we do is we have four experiments. The first one here is what we call a control, where we simply take some fresh eggs, add some fresh sperm in a Petri dish. This represents a pet Petri dish. And then we watch development of the egg through the classic stages of embryonic development in a frog. First cell, and this little thing here, if you see it, um, what happens in, in eggs is that the female pronucleus, it's half a, half a nucleus at this stage, it's divided in meiosis, sits at the top of the egg ready for the sperm to, to meet and join that. And after that happens, um, some hours later, first division, then that divides in two and on it goes dividing in half um, until we get an embryo. Now the control is very important. Because first of all, when we do this, it tells us that the sperm are effective. 
and it tells us whether our eggs are capable of being, re being fertilized. That's not a simple thing because um, frog eggs age, if you leave them sitting on the bench for more than 20 minutes, or depending on the hormone treatment you use on the females, your eggs may not be fertile. So we always run what is called a control in our experiments. The second one is called ICSI, and that, that is short for inter, inter, intra cytoplasmic sperm injection. And so in this case, you see there's a, a pipette here or a sharp needle. Uh, we use a little bit more than a sharp needle in our method. It doesn't really matter. What we do is take one sperm, and that's that nucleus in there, and we inject it into the egg. If that's successful, we end up with normal development. Now, we also have an experiment that's called a sham, where we just jab the needle into the egg. Now, we need to do that. Notice that there's no development that happens there. Occasionally, in this sort of work, just jabbing a needle into an embryo, into an egg, will cause what's called parthenogenetic development, um, or sometimes androgenesis. So we do that ways to be sure that anything that we do in the first three are all controls for this is the important experimental approach called somatic cell nuclear transfer. So this little dot here is the nucleus of Rheobatricus. So we should take a step back and say um, on the presentation that you're all we shared, there's some slides before us where I give the name of, the, of all the people in our team. I didn't do all this myself. There was a team of five or six people and we had experts in various different um, parts of biology that needed to be brought together to make this possible. So we got the nucleus of Rheobacus silus um, from a most fortunate occurrence. And that is um, Professor Michael Tyler at Adelaide University who worked on the gastric brooding frog as a major star in the 1970s um, and early 80s on the southern gastric brooding frog, had, after some died in his lab, just put them in his freezer in the lab. Now, what chance that a freezer wouldn't break down in 20 years? I don't know, but it didn't. And so um, a decade ago, when we found there were three carcasses in his fridge, um, along with Michael Tyler, who um, unfortunately died this year, earlier this year. Um, we put together the concept of the Lazarus Project because we knew there was frozen cells. This is really important because um, cells that have been fixed in alcohol or formalin, the DNA is degraded and can't be used. But a frozen cell has the potential opportunity of being able to be revived. Um, not a high level, but um, that's what we tried to do. So we took nuclei that we derived from various tissues of the gastric brooding frog, and we injected them just like we inject sperm over here in our control into an egg. There's a cross here because what we have to do is remove the female nucleus of the recipient egg, and we're putting in a diploid cell. This is a haploid cell for those who know a bit about biology, half the number of chromosomes in a sperm. This is a normal diploid nucleus, the total number of chromosomes. And this is what we hope to have seen. And in um, pretty much um, that's what we did see. Um, I'll just take you through step by step again. Um, the techniques that are used, we hormonally induce the release of sperm. So we inject a male frog with testosterone and it releases sperm. We used a frog called the Bard River Frog, which you actually have in um, Jungla. Um, we used examples from Southern Range down near Newcastle where I work. So we used Mixifies fasciolatus to produce donor eggs because they're very large eggs. We thought that we needed a large egg because the gastric brooding frog produced large eggs and a small number of them because there was no tadpole that was free living. The tadpole grew completely from the yolk on a very large egg provided by the mother in the mother's stomach. So we chose a frog with large eggs. We only produced the sperm. Uh, we collected the sperm um, just in 
just with fairly simple apparatus, pipettes. Um, we also involved ourselves with sperm inactivation because we wanted to use live cells and dead cells. Um, we counted and looked at activation and then we went through our process for our controls. That's pretty much the control. Importantly, um, all of this sequence of development is, is very tightly timed. So we could do um, an experiment if we were successful early in the morning and by eight o'clock or nine o'clock, we would know whether we were successful because we could time this cleavage, second cleavage and so on. So the system is quite precise. Um, we did the same with this process called ICSI. Uh, I should say that these techniques are commonly used, well, not commonly used, they are widely used, at least in human infertility. And so the techniques are directly borrowed from a large amount of experience in human um, fertility clinics and in also in lots of animals. These are not just designed for frogs, they are just modified to work with frogs. Um, we, we would hope, in fact, when we started the project, we hoped to use this method because according to Michael Tyler, one of the frogs that he put in his um, freezer was a male. And that made us very exciting because technically if we could have had sperm, which is a very compressed nucleus, um, we thought that it wouldn't be damaged by freezing. And it's got this incredible capacity that a diploid cell doesn't have. Its job is to fertilize. But we knew if we did have a sperm or any sperm, we'd then have to come back through a hybrid. We'd have to use Rheobatricus's DNA to hybridize with mixifiers and then retrieve Rheobatricus. But if we were able to turn on the Rheobatricus genome, we, we would have been like, thought we were going to be um, there anyhow. Um, it turns out that while Michael Tyler had described 112 frogs and was a great anatomist, he didn't know um, what a testis was. Um, there was no male frog um, and uh, we didn't have a testis to work with. Um, the frogs that he'd frozen were two juveniles and one female. And unfortunately the female also had no eggs. So we, we didn't have any, any sperm that we could retrieve from the, from the frozen carcasses. So we proceeded with this method as a control because it would, if we were successful with this method, it would tell us that our injection process was, was a successful method. Now then we come to the real experiment, which is um, the injection of a nuclear cell um, from a frozen gastric brooding frog. And this is called somatic cell nuclear transfer. Um, the common word is cloning. This is exactly what is done when you clone. Uh, when they clone Dolly the sheep, the cell that they injected was a mammary cell. Um, we, we took um, a whole lot of different cells, kidney cells, fibroblasts, nuclear cells. We tried a range. The first thing you've got to do with your recipient egg, which comes from a live frog is we remove the jelly coat and that nucleus is sitting at the top. We then quickly put a very fine needle into the egg and that activates the egg. There's a technical step which causes this nucleus to go into meiosis. It actually causes it to come to the top of the pole. Meiosis occurs and the DNA is halved. The next thing is there are two steps here we have to enucleate the egg. We've got to get rid of that nucleus. There are two ways that this is done technically in human IVF. One is to use very fine needles and pry it out. So like a physical removal of nucleus from the top of an egg. The, other, the alternate method is to quickly expose it to ultraviolet radiation, which kills the DNA or destroys the DNA, kills not the right word, it breaks up the, the bonds. And knowing the right dose and the distance from your resource, there are a whole lots of things here I won't worry about that took us a long time. After that, we come to the last step where we micro inject a somatic nuclei from the gastric brooding frog into the egg. And this is what we then hope to see. 
Um, so were we successful? Um, uh, in fact, yes, we were, but not 100%. So quite often we would get um, to this stage where we got up to about 120 cell division stage. So we got 120 cells, at which stage these cells are called smears, early, embry early embryos, and then things would So the next thing we did was to take those cells and distillate them. So this is divided cells in an early embryo with gastric bullfrog DNA in there. We then had to divide them up and then put them into sterile media because we then tried to re-inject them in a process called serial injection, which is actually well known um, for decades in cloning to do serial. Every time you do one more step from a, a cell that's been through this stage, you get further and further down the line. And the reason is, is because the DNA of a somatic cell um, has, has been altered during the process of turning into a tissue. And you've got to re um, adjust that DNA and remove proteins off the outside of it, which are blocking it. And you do that in serial steps. So our standard process was to put those nuclei from there in, in sterile media under paraffin oil. And we would cryopreserve into minus 120 degrees in cryoprotectant the cells we didn't use because we had many more cells than we could use in our experiment. So in our minus 120 freezer at Newcastle and also in Adelaide, we split our collection because it's so rare. We have um, uh, several hundred nuclei of Rhea batricus, which have been turned on, but obviously not turned yet into a frog. Um, so the important thing here is um, most of this work on the methods at least has been published. Um, so the protocols for where, whereby we freeze and do things um, is all published and you can look at that on the, when you share this on uh, YouTube. Um, so um, this talk was about creating the genome bank. I suppose what people want to know is, well, where did we get to? Um, I can say that I've seen Rhea batricus um, silus, the southern gastric brooding frogs, as an embryo of about 120 cells, at which stage the egg rotates um, the inside, the, the, um, so the membrane, and uh, you pray that it's going to be alive, but we have never got it past that stage, and we don't know why. Um, that's probably the next 10 years of research. One of the grunts we've got is that some of our controls also fail at that stage. And if your controls fail then, and they're using living cells that you've injected in, there's something wrong. And we actually believe that the current break is degellying the eggs. So when we reported this, and you can also go online and just do a Google search for Project Lazarus. There is a BBC um, documentary for about a half an hour that documents the whole process because every lab session we did when we did the nuclear transfer was filmed. Um, so there is a, it's about a decade old, called Lazarus. Um, so uh, why haven't we got back there? Time and money, I suppose, like all science. Uh, also trying to work out we don't want to use rare material until we've solved the current dilemma. We did receive some considerable, well, philosophical criticism, but some other criticism. And so we have, we've had two labs sequence the embryos or parts of the embryos that we had grow. And they have both confirmed that they are rear batricus silus DNA. Um, and the only way they can do that is that the DNA is divided and is active. So um, we haven't produced a frog. We haven't cloned a frog like they did with Dolly, but we've got to the very early stages. Um, I would hope, as Conrad hopes, that he might find them in Uranda Creek, and I hope he does. And I hope he finds them and we don't have to go on with any more cloning. Um, it's a different species and it would be just fantastic.
Um, so the work I've told you about is really a, an approach to what we call de-extinction. And if you follow a lot of the problems of climate change and what's going on in the world, the greatest dilemma we face is the biodiversity crisis. Um, it's part now of climate change, but it was happening well before climate change. Conrad mentioned it, that more than half the species on our planet are predicted to go extinct within 100 years unless we do something. Um, and, it's, it's, uh, and so trying to work out how you, how you can put a stop to that as an insurance policy um, with cloning is where, we, where we've been as a, as a process. So thanks very much for your patience. Sorry. Um, yeah, thanks, thanks, Michael. That was a fascinating presentation. And, uh, you know, hopefully, you know, like that is something that we can, uh, we can use to, to uh, bring back some of these species that have been lost in the, uh, and uh, especially these two frogs that are still facing threats other than climate change as well. Uh, so we know that um, here in Mackay, uh, that there's a proposal to build a, a big dam uh, on that will flood Urana Creek. And if that turns out to be the last place where the, the northern gastric brooding frogs exist, it'll be an interesting uh, decision-making process for those who, who are in charge of making those sort of decisions as to whether, uh, you know, that frog matters. Um, yeah, so is anyone ha if there's anyone online or uh, anyone here in the room has a question for Michael, then um, please uh, take yourself off mute and ask that question if you like. So, Ashley's got something. There are a couple of other questions that have been in the chat. Okay. So one from Michael and Okay, so there's two questions, uh, one for Michael and one for Conrad in the chat. I don't know whether you two can see those and maybe uh, Conrad, you could go first if you don't. I think I, I think I caught them. I sort of caught up a bit late because I suddenly realised the chat was happening, but did I, I answer Jason? Ask question? Yeah, was it the one from Jason about uh, how the previous surveys went? What was the question? Sorry, actually, um, is there any known ways to eradicate the virus in the waterways or work being done to find it? No, uh, there there isn't there isn't any way to eradicate that we know of yet. Um, the you can clear a frog of chytrid, an individual frog, by treating it. Um, but no, there's no way. Once it gets in these environments, it's just it's there. For, for in, in terms of the current state of play, we can't get it out of environments once it once it's in there. We just we have to hope that frogs persist due to environmental factors in some areas, even if they decline in others. And then ultimately we have to hope for some adaptation. For, for a lot of diseases, you do get that initial really heavy impact and then you get that adaptation of individuals that survive the original one and you get recovery. And we believe we're seeing that recovery in the wet tropics for some species. So I think if they frog populations can persist through that original impact, you do have a good chance of recovery afterwards. Conrad. Uh, and what was the other question from Michael, Ashley? Yeah, so it's from Deborah, and it's if you produce a living frog, will it actually be half uh, living frog or half living frog? So it's a question. Did you did you catch that, uh, Michael? Uh, if, if the question was, uh, you know, if if you produce a living frog, will it be half uh, southern gastric brooding frog and half of the female that you are uh, using to to produce the the new living specimen. Yeah, thanks very much. I, I heard most of it, Peter. Um, if we achieve it using somatic cells, that's body cells, it would be a rheobatricus. Of course, if we did it 10 times, it would be, they would all be clones. They'd all be that one same genome um, and one frog in that we might have multiple frogs, but genetically they'd be identical. Um, if we did it with sperm, it would, it would be a hybrid. So I hope that answers the question. Uh, and we have one more question in the room here. So from Alison. Yeah. Um, just a question for you, Conrad. I'm just wondering about um, cane toads in the crawler sort of upland areas, if they've suffered the same fate as the frogs in those areas. 
no, no. Unfortunately, cane toads seem to do just fine with chytrid. Um, no, like no. We just basically see no um, deaths of toads due to chytrid. It's maybe something in their skin. Uh, you, you do see chytrid effects on quite common frogs, like green tree frogs, in in areas like if you get really cold periods. Um, so most frogs, it seems, can be impacted by chytrid, even if you don't see population declines in that species. But so there's some species that don't seem to be impacted at all, and toads are one of them. Yeah, so that's that's interesting. Um, can I just, I had a question for Michael while I'm talking. And do you know what mitochondrial DNA is doing in this along the way, Michael? Because presumably that plays an important part as well. And you've got the mitochondria because you've got the females, but do you, have you been able to see what's happening with the mitochondria as you're getting these, uh, you know, divisions and these experiments going? Yeah, thanks, Conrad. Yeah, um, uh, it's, it is also a very big issue because um, the recipient egg has mixifies mitochondrial DNA and lots of it. Um, so we, we've done tests at the end to test the mitochondrial DNA and we normally end up with um, the recipient egg having the mitochondria. So whether it is a possibility that there's a discordance between the mitochondria of our recipient's egg and the mixified and the Rheobatricus nuclear DNA, um, which causes the breakdown of development. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's something that we haven't been able to get really deep into. And I think our problem with our controls, which really show us that the real problem seems to be degelling. Um, there's another frog model uh, worldwide that's cloned and where a lot of work is done and that's on the Xenopus, uh, Xenopus um, Levis um, and uh, a fellow named um, Ian Gurdon um, who has worked most of his life on uh, using frog eggs to, to understand an incredible amount of biochemistry that goes on in, in eggs. Unbelievable um, that happens in eggs of all animals. Ian Gurdon uh, clones Xenopus many times. He degelates his eggs with no trouble at all. In fact, he just does it in a shaker in his lab and does all the micro injections. And he has no trouble, but it seems to us that every time we degelate eggs, our controls stop at about the same time as our experiments. Um, it would seem simple just to, well, why not just inject straight through the jelly? Um, <laughs> this is like um, a rubber ball. It's unbelievably tough stuff. It goops up every needle, which our needles are microns thick and made of glass. And um, under the microscope, you can watch them bend and shatter when they hit the jelly. So there's just a lot of technical issues that one has to face doing this. Um, I'm pretty sure it's the degelling because it's the one step um, in both the controls and our experiments where things seem to um, cause problems. So yeah, technical question, Conrad. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, no, I was just interested. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Uh, we've still got one more question from here in the room. That's from Brooke. Hi, yeah, and this is for um, Michael. I was wondering how long the few specimens you have can remain frozen before there is um, cell damage. So, um, sorry, thanks. Um, Peter, could you repeat that? I didn't get it all strongly. Uh, how long can you keep those, uh, those specimens stored frozen uh, until they're cell damage? The okay, ones that you um, produce? Yeah, that, no, that's a really good question. Um, IVF and cryobiology is a relatively new science, um, but I think probably the oldest we have of frozen cells from our own species um, in IVF clinics and things like cattle is well and truly over 20 or 30 years now. Um, scientists really didn't know when they froze down um, sperm, say from cattle, whether after a decade there would be some degradation. Um, and so uh, the answer is uh, for 
human sperm and cattle and a whole range of other things if the cryoprotectant is good so you don't just fro freeze them you you um you put the cells in a cryoprotectant uh normally it, that's not a complicated thing that may be something like glycerol um, sucrose um, egg albumin um, they're normally a little bit of a cocktail mixture um, we didn't invent those in this process we just simply went to the literature for from human cryobiology and borrowed their recipes so we froze our cells in a cryoprotectant and if it's like um, humans and cattle i think a minimum of 30 or 40 years um, and perhaps much much longer once they're frozen at 120 degrees minus 120 degrees that's important that's why your question's important because um, once we have um, cells that, where we've turned the DNA on and we and they've replicated um, they are living cells and somebody in the future with technology much better than ours I hope we'll be able to bring um, Rheobatricus back if Conrad doesn't rediscover it um, that's that was the really the gist of the talk which I've put up which um, was more about what I call the insurance policy when things are going extinct. If you cast your mind back to the start of Conrad's talk, in 1984, when Rheobatricus vitalinus was discovered, we knew we'd lost the first gastric brooding frog and several day frogs. At that stage, as a, as a biologist working on frogs in Australia, we didn't know whether there was gonna be 10, 20, 50, or 100 frogs go extinct. We didn't even know the cause. All we knew was that frogs were starting to disappear. And people were running around saying, put them in zoos and things. And um, the lab I, I was in started to say, let's freeze some cells so that we have a gene bank. I mean, that's what we do with endangered plants. We have gene banks, we have seed banks. Somehow or other, the message that um, you can do that with animals has not quite got out there. Now I know, why it hasn't and that's because well it's so much harder to bring back but if you haven't frozen the dna you've got no chance and i can tell you another six species that have gone extinct since the gastric brooding frog went extinct and trying to convince conservation agencies that if you're down to the last 500 for crying out loud talk to a cryobiologist and and freeze some sperm and eggs or embryos we do it for our own species, for our own selfish um, reproductive biology. Why can't we do it for our precious animals? Uh, I don't really quite understand the philosophical pushback on this. Um, although, I, as I say, um, we had quite a large num amount of philosophical pushback on Project Lazarus. I had emails asking me whether I was going to bring back Hitler. Like, go figure. Well, we don't want Hitler coming back, but, uh, you know, that's a great takeaway, Michael, that uh, people should be, uh, you know, like doing that type of work in the future. I just I think we, we need to probably wind the meeting up. There's a number of people who probably have other things on their agenda for the evening. Um, but like just to say thank you very much uh, again to our presenters uh, and to all the people who've joined us uh, tonight online and here in the room at uh, Mackay Environment Centre. And, uh, you know, yeah, thank you very much. So just a round of applause for our, our presenters. And thank you. Okay, well, everyone, um, we'll just say good night. Uh, just a reminder that, you know, the Urana Creek is a, a place that Mackay Conservation Group is working to protect. And we'd like to see the, uh, the habitat of the northern gastric brooding frog uh, protected and other species that, that live in that area. Uh, so. If you want to find out more, you can go to mackayconservationgroup.org.au slash urana, or you can go to urana.com.au and we'll share that in the uh, recording of this uh, segment on YouTube tomorrow. Okay, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you, Peter.